Hey everyone, and welcome to our first NSC Live event of the new year. We once again have Nikki back to answer all of your selling questions. So thanks for being here, Nikki. Hi, so glad to be back. We're glad to have you back too. All right, our first question here, this comes from Brenda. And she says she's wanting to embroider a phoenix or a dragon on her son's t-shirt pockets. And she wants to know how to stabilize the pockets for t-shirt material that is already sewn onto the shirt. So I, we, get, we, we did get the follow-up question that she is going to be hand embroidering, but how would you stabilize it for both hand embroidery and or machine embroidery? Um, so I have not done a whole lot of hand embroidery, um, more machine embroidery experience here. Um, so for machine embroidery, you want to match the stabilizer weight to the fabric weight. So you want to find the, the right stabilizer for your fabric, and that's important for the final look of the, of the design. Um, so for a t-shirt fabric that's generally pretty light, I would say to go with um, like a, a, a fabric feel of tearaway stabilizer. So stabilizer will sometimes come in the film variety or the the white kind of fabric type variety. So, um, and the film variety is a lot thinner. So I would go with the fabric variety for a t-shirt material. Um, so if you're embroidering a pocket, I would think um, you might need to take the pocket off the shirt first before you embroider if you want to still be able to use the pocket because otherwise the design would be sewn right through the pocket and the shirt and you wouldn't be able to use the pocket anymore. So you'll, you'll have to take the pocket off and um, lay it on some tearaway stabilizer and do your embroidery, either machine or hand embroidery. I don't know if hand embroidery works the same way as um, machine embroidery. Ashley, do you have any hand embroidery experience? Very little, and I do know we have a class um, actually on starting it off already. We have a class on National Science Circle um, where we have someone who did a bunch of hand embroidery stitches. And I knew um, growing up watching my mom do a lot of silk ribbon embroidery, uh, she never stabilized anything doing that. So I do believe it is a little bit different because obviously you can adjust how tight you're pulling those stitches, and it's not. I mean, unless you are amazing, you're not going as fast as that machine. So I don't think you have to worry about that much as well. So I would definitely say, definitely use those tips for um, machine embroidery, but maybe not so much. You won't. It's not as necessary, I don't think, for hand embroidery. But to follow up on that, uh, would you still remove the pocket even for hand embroidery, or would you go ahead and just leave it on? Um, for hand embroidery, it would probably be a lot easier to just get your hand inside of the pocket and do your embroidery. So that would eliminate that step. You wouldn't have to take the pocket off like you would with, if you were hooping it, you know, for a machine. That's true. So, That's true. Another yeah. thing I like to do, so even when I'm... Um, trying to say pin something and I don't want to get the layer that's behind it. I always take something like, like a clear acrylic ruler like this and like slide it down in the pocket. That way your needle will like, I want to say bounce off. Oh. It. It'll, you won't accidentally snag. Yeah. Fabric that you didn't want to, to snag. Oh, right. Good tip. So thank you. So um, I know we get a lot of questions. A lot of people are, are new to sewing, new to embroidery, that kind of stuff. And we always get questions about machines. And I know you've talked in the past about, different things to look for in uh, just a standard sewing machine, but do you have any tips on what to look for if someone's wanting to get into machine embroidery, like machine machines for embroidery? Yeah. Um, yeah, so um, embroidery machines, uh, a lot of times, you know, they, they make them so that they are dual sewing and embroidery machines, which is really useful. Um, and there's a wide range out there, you know, from starter models that are pretty simple to the big computerized with the screen and you know all kinds of um, options available so it depends on your budget uh, because they get pretty expensive it's it's some you know it's a big piece of machinery um, a lot of technology in there so it's you can spend um, on an embroidery machine as much as you would spend on a car yeah, I usually when I see when there's when I see it says financing options available, I usually look at a different model. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but you can go on the um, the company's website and browse through their models and options. Some websites um, 
don't have the prices on them, which is kind of annoying. You have to go to a dealer to find out prices or call. Um, but I worked, when I worked for Sony News Magazine, I worked a lot on um, the FOF machines. Um, so FOF has a lot of uh, different machines for sewing and embroidery. Um, I know Baby Lock is one that has a lot of embroidery models. Um, Singer, Husqvarna Viking. Um, so, yeah, it just it depends on what you're using your machine for. If you want to start a business where you're embroidering things, you want to probably invest in a really good machine that has a lot of options. Um, but if you're just kind of dipping your foot in the water, I would say you can start with something, um, you know, a little bit on the lower end to make sure you like it and you want to continue doing it. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm partial to FOF, as you can see by my FOF machine here that I love. Um, so I think they're really good machines. Um, we had a bunch of different machines in the sewing room at the office at Sew News, and whenever I had to go embroider something, I always went to the FOF. So um, that's just my opinion. I know people have their other brand loyalties, but you know, they all, you know, they have kind of the same hardware in them. It's just a matter of which model has all the bells and whistles and things like that. Absolutely. And I know, I know you may be brand loyal. I'm I'm just loyal to sewing machines in general. I'm pretty sure in my house right now I have four or five different brands of machines and I actually <laughs> have there's one machine brand that I don't have, but don't worry, I have one of those machines on the way. So that's <laughs> one of them as well. So I like I like to show the love to everybody. I'll use any machine out there. Uh, and I have each one has like a different purpose. Like one, I have a Viking that is an embroidery machine. It does so too, but I don't usually sew on it. I just embroider it. And then like my brother, I go all sewing on. But so yeah, pick your pick your brand or try out all of them. Yeah, yeah. It always helps to go to a dealer and test drive. That's my tip for when people are shopping for sewing machines too. It helps to get a feel for it if you actually sit and sew on it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right, so we've also gotten a lot of questions about thread. So a lot of things uh, about thread is, people wanna know what is the best thread to use with certain things, but then also, what is it you would use elastic thread for? <laughs> well, for the first part of the question, uh, as far as the best threads to use, um, <clears throat> you've got in, you know, in your craft store, you've got Guterman, Coates and Clark, uh, American and Eford, and you know those big brands. Um, and I don't see one as better than the other. It's just whatever brand has the color that I'm looking for to match my fabric. So that is how I choose my thread. Yeah, look at you and your thread racks. I'm jealous of. Color coordinated, of course. You know. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then, so for elastic thread, which elastic thread, you will not find with the thread in the thread section. You'll find it with the elastic in the elastic section. So what do you use elastic thread for? Um, you can use it for a, a lot of different things. You can use it for some crafting and, you know, making bracelets and such. But um, typically it's used for shearing or gathering up fabric. So shearing is um, sewing many lines um, with your elastic thread to gather up the fabric to create almost like a smocking effect. Um, but the elastic thread does not go threaded through your needle. It actually goes wound around your bobbin. So all machines are different, but typically you would hand wind your bobbin with your elastic thread. Um, and you don't want to wind it super duper tight unless your machine calls for that some might but generally you want to wind it by hand not super loose so that it's kind of jumbled and falling off but just with a tiny little bit of tension on it just pull ever so slightly as you're winding your thread around your bobbin um so for shearing um wind your thread around your bobbin drop it in your bobbin case as you normally would, you know, pull the, the elastic thread up through the throat plate as you normally would, use uh, regular all-purpose thread in the needle. <clears throat> um, 
and you want to increase your stitch length um, to like a basting stitch length. Maybe not the longest you can go, but a nice long stitch length. Um, shearing works, works best on lighter weight fabrics. So if you're trying to shear like a corduroy or a bottom weight, it's not really going to work. It's just too thick and heavy to scrunch up and give you that, that smocked look that shearing um, is meant for. So a lightweight fabric, one layer if you can manage it. Um, lightweight cottons like quilting cottons are great for shearing. Um, so you've got your elastic thread in your bobbin, you've got your basting stitch length, and you just stitch straight, you know, straight lines. Um, and one line of stitching will gather your fabric up a little bit, but the more lines you do parallel, the scrunchier your fabric will get. And if you give everything a shot of steam afterward, it'll bunch everything up even more. So I didn't know that steam tip. That is very good. Uh -huh. yeah. Um, so yeah, you can use it to create, um, create contouring in like a dress, you know, you can do it around the, the middle to give yourself a little, uh, contouring kind of, um, you can use it for like faux waistband on skirts. Um, it's really great for kids clothes, kids dresses, cause it's easy, it's comfortable, it'll grow with them. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, you should try shearing. It's fun. Okay, well, so I have a couple follow-up questions because you yeah. know I was going to. So you mentioned smocking. So can you give us, you don't have to tell us exactly, you know, everything about smocking, but how what is smocking and how is it different from shearing? So smocking is um, like, like tight pleats. So it's like a decorative effect on um, garments. Mm -hmm. Um, typically just like a section of a garment, like the yoke or something, um, where the material is, um, pleated in a certain way and then, um, stitched together. So you'll, you'll see a lot of times that like diamond pattern, mm -hmm. um, that is smocking basically. Perfect. And of course we have a video on National Sewing Circle that I actually did, um, sewing with texture, but then a section of that is on regular smocking and then Canadian smocking, which is the more decorative. So if you've ever seen, the, I feel like the most common one is you see them, I see them at Target all the time, every time I go, but it's a circle pillow and then it's got around the outside edge, all of these really nice gathers and that's done with Canadian smocking. So cool. there is a difference. <laughs> um, another follow-up question to that. So, and we get questions about this a lot. And I know you've talked about tension many, many times, but is that something you have to adjust when you are working with elastic thread and or how do you put it back when you're done? Um, no, tension is not typically something you need to adjust when you are smocking. So you can just leave your tension as it is. Um, but we could talk a lot about tension if you want to ask some follow-up tension questions. <laughs> of course, so my, I'm gonna say my main I think the main tension problem is, uh, is how do you know that it's actually a tension problem versus something else? Yes, that is a really good question. So when you're getting problems um, with your stitching, uh, there are some telltale signs. So if you're getting, um, if you're getting thread nests on the bottom of your sewing, that is, uh, so if you're getting thread nests on the underside, mm -hmm. it's typically a, an issue with the needle thread. And conversely, if you're getting thread nests on the, the upper side of your fabric, it'll be a problem with the bobbin thread. Um, so it, it is difficult to tell when it's a tension issue versus when it's a needle issue versus when it's a fabric and thread combination issue. So the first thing that I would do when I'm experiencing issues is make sure my machine is threaded correctly. Number one, make sure, then make sure your bobbin is threaded correctly. Um, make sure you have, make sure your needle is not dull. So you, if you know you're starting with a pretty fresh needle, you can, you know, check that off of the list. Um, um, make sure your machine is cleaned out. 
So if you're chronically getting tension issues or you know thread nests or skip stitches, um, there's a possibility that it's just dust accumulated, dust and, and lint accumulated in your machine that's screwing up your tension. Um, because every point that the thread touches on its way through the machine adds a little more tension to it. So if you've got stuff gunking up, it can create all kinds of problems. So take off your thread plate, dust out, floss out your tension discs, um, and you're just, you'll be starting from a nice clean place where you know you're not gonna cause yourself any issues. Um, so when you want to, when you suspect you're having a tension issue and you want to test it out, I would recommend putting contrasting thread in the needle and in the bobbin, so like something that's going to contrast from the fabric you're stitching on and from each other, so you can really see what's going on. Um, so stitch yourself a line, see what's going on. You want the fabric, you want the, the needle thread and the bobbin thread to link right in between, right in the middle. Um, so if you can see thread loops on the upper side of your fabric, your needle tension is too tight because it's pulling that bottom thread up too strongly. So you wanna knock it down a little bit. And when you're making tension adjustments, go half in half increments. So go from five to four and a half or whatever. Um, and conversely, if you're getting thread loops on the underside of your fabric, your needle thread is not tight enough. So you're going to be making adjustments to the needle, the needle tension. Um, but if you get all the way over to one side of your needle tension or the other, if you get like down to zero or if you get up to nine, you might want to adjust your bobbin tension to just even it out um, so that your needle tension is sitting more in the middle. <coughs> um, adjusting your bobbin tension is um, not something that a lot of people mess with. Um, sometimes your machine manual won't even tell you how to do it because it's such a delicate process. They don't want you to, you know, throw anything out of whack. They'd rather you take it into the sewing machine doctor. But if you Google it, type in your machine brand and model and bob and tension adjustment, um, you'll probably come up with a tutorial on how to do it. Uh, my main tip for that would be uh, make very, very, very tiny adjustments to your bobbin tension because it doesn't take much to change. And the screw is super tiny, so do it over a bowl just in case that screw comes out. For whatever reason, you don't want to lose it. Um, <clears throat> so <clears throat> um, just keep going half increments at a time until you get your tension um, adjusted. And when you're sewing on a, a thicker fabric, you're going to need a looser tension as a rule. Um, when you're sewing on a thinner fabric, you'll want to have a, a little bit of a tighter tension so that the threads will lay nice and flat um, against the fabric. And with a thicker fabric, you know, you want to give that the thickness of the fabric some room. So you want to have a little bit of a looser tension. Mm -hmm. um, so other things for tension, um, if you are still having issues after you know trying to adjust your tension and you just can't seem to get it right, um, you've got a sharp needle, your sewing machine is all cleaned out, um, make sure you have the right bobbin in your machine. That has happened to me before where I have a million bobbins just floating around from different machines. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and some bobbins are just a tiny little bit taller than other ones. And if you throw the wrong bobbin in your machine, things just aren't going to uh, hook up right. It's just not the right fit for the machine. And you'll have all kinds of issues. Yeah, that's definitely true. I know, as I mentioned, I have multiple machines. Um, and it's really easy to tell, you know, um, I mean, circumference wise. Yeah, there we go. Like yeah. if, if it's going to fit or not, because it just it physically won't fit in there. But yeah, there's definitely. Um, and I think 
I have like a, a 15 J or something type bobbin. Um, and there is one, I mean, you're right. You have to put them right next to each other. And I mean, it is the difference of like a pin. I mean, it is so tiny and you wouldn't think that that little tiny bit would throw you off, but, but it definitely can. Yes. Um, so you mentioned you're talking about, you know, whether to know it was a tension issue or a needle issue. So we have a question here from Brenda and she wants to know how often should I change my needles? Well, um, Conventional wisdom says every six or so hours. Um, my mother-in-law, yes, Karen, I'm gonna call you out, <laughs> didn't change her needle for years. Mm -hmm. um, some people change their needle when it breaks. <laughs> that's that's their, their clue for when it needs to be changed, it'll just break. Mm -hmm. um, but if you start getting tension issues, thread nests, um, just always change your needle first thing. That's the first thing I do if it's getting on the verge of about six hours of sewing time. And it's hard to log, you know, how many hours you have on a needle, especially if you're changing needles. Um, when I take a needle off my machine, I just put it in a little piece of paper and estimate how many hours it has on it. Um, but it's not very precise. So if you're getting tension issues, Try to throw on a new needle, see if that helps. Or if you're getting um, flagging on your fabric, so if your fabric starts kind of bouncing on the machine bed when the needle goes through it and making a little thunk, thunk, thunk noise, that's a pretty good indication that you've got a dull needle and it's just having a hard time piercing your fabric. Perfect. So I have to I have to admit, so I'm not as bad, maybe I I have changed needles on my machine, obviously. Um, <laughs> but I'm sort of of the idea that I kind of wait until there's an issue until I change it. I'm, that might sound bad, but I want to get like the absolute most usable time out of my needle that I possibly can. And so I kind of know that, you know, if I sat down and it's been, I mean, weeks since I've changed a needle and I have an issue, then I definitely, that is my first thing to change, knowing that that's most likely what it is. But I've always said that I wish um, my sewing machine was more like my car and had like a change oil light, you know, like <laughs> change needle light. Because one of my machines has a little light that comes on and it tells you when your bobbin's low. So I feel like that's something that, you know, a machine should do that. They should be like, your machine has run six hours before you change. I think we have a good idea here. That, that's an excellent idea. Yeah. <laughs> if I only knew how to actually do that. Totally. <laughs> no idea. It seems like a, like a really like common sense thing. Like why wouldn't they, why would they not put that on machine? If I see that on a machine now after this live event, oh man, I'm gonna <laughs> call the Ashley thing. I don't know. I'm just kidding. Okay. We have a question here. This is more quilting related, but I want to throw it out there to you anyway. Um, because you may be familiar with maybe not necessarily quilting a quilt, but have you ever done any kind of tying of a quilt or tying of the edges of a blanket? Um, and if so, what are some tips for that? Um, so the tie edges, um, I feel like I did that on a fleece blanket um, a while back where you just, you get two layers of fleece together and cut the edges and then tie them. And it's a really quick and easy way to make a, a cute throw, especially if you know, so there's some cute fleece fabric um, at the store. Um, but I don't, it, it's been a while, so I don't really think I have any major tips for that. Okay, well, so I'm gonna re rephrase the tying of the quilt question just because normally when you tie a quilt, you have, you know, thread or yarn or embroidery floss or just something and you go through all the later layers, you bring it up and you tie it in a little knot. Oh. So if you were gonna do that, what sort of embroidery thread or floss or thread or what would you use that would be the strongest or, you know, hold up the best for that kind of method? Okay, I see what you mean. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, embroidery floss would probably be a good bet. Um, embroidery floss will come in like, I don't think I have any, but it comes in like, it's got six strands or something and you can separate it for however many strands you want to use. So like three strands of embroidery floss or something would probably make a really nice thick or um, yarn even, like a thin yarn mm -hmm. would probably be good for that. You look like you have some tips to share, Ashley. <laughs> I've never done a little, but I, I, I'm somebody who does a lot of crocheting and knitting, so I always have yarn laying around. I have excess fiber things <laughs> in my house. So that's probably what I would go with. Um, and I feel like it's the easiest to 
you know, to, to knot and not have to worry about threads getting jumbled or anything. So I would probably pick um, like a nice lightweight yarn or something like that. But that's just my, I mean, partial to yarn. Yes. <laughs> so um, speaking of yarn and embroidery floss and things like that, is there, and I know you know how to do this, a way to incorporate that into a sewing project decoratively? Absolutely. I like your leading questions. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, um, you can add some yarn or thicker fibers onto your project in a couple of different ways, actually. You can um, do what's called bobbin work, which is essentially um, the same, not the same thing, but like shearing in that you wind your thicker fabric or your thicker um, fiber um, on your bobbin. Um, so that it will come out, you know, up through the throat plate. And um, so you'll want to be sewing with the wrong side down so that the, the bobbin work will come out on the, the bottom. It comes out on, you know, the bottom um, of your fabric. Mm -hmm. um, or you can also just lay your, your yarn or what have you. Uh, on the top of your fabric and select a, a wide zigzag stitch and just zigzag over it. Um, and you'd want to use a different sewing machine foot for that. And I don't have my bag of feet down here, but any foot that has like a groove on the underside of it, like a cording foot or a beading foot, that will would allow that yarn or um, cord or whatever to just slide under the foot. Um, you could use that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and use using a, an invisible thread in the needle would be that'd be a good time to use invisible thread or like a matching thread in the needle. Yes, absolutely. So I think about invisible thread just because I know we have it on the site, but we have a video on National Sewing Circle where ZJ Hambach, one of our instructors, kind of gives um, some tips on working with invisible thread and shows some of the different types of invisible thread because it is a little bit um, stiffer sometimes than, you know, regular thread. And so ways to sort of work with that. But then also want to throw this out. I haven't tried it yet. I just saw it on Pinterest because good old Pinterest gives me mm -hmm. um, ideas. But so somebody had the neckline of a shirt and they were adding really thin chain along there and they actually used the button foot on their machine and did the button attachment stitch like every third chain and yeah. match and so that's another fun way to sort of add an embellishment to the top so i'm gonna try it out soon and i'll let you know how it goes yeah, yeah definitely do that's that's a really good idea for adding something that is kind of big and chunky like that where you probably wouldn't even be able to use a cording foot to slide under the foot just mm -hmm. tacking it in different places. Yeah, absolutely. All right, we have kind of a long one here, but we have someone that asks, so I've decided to make an aerial costume and I need help with the mermaid skirt. I've sewn a pencil skirt so far and I'm planning on attaching a circle skirt to the bottom of that. I'm really hoping to find a way to achieve a lot of volume with the circle skirt, but I also need a fabric that can stretch so I can walk. Mm -hmm. A friend recommended I gather tulle underneath and sew it with a serger. Would that work and be easy enough to achieve or what other materials or suggestions do you have? Okay, so that is going to be fabulous. I want to see pictures of it. Yeah. Um, and for adding volume under a skirt, I have done the tool thing and I find it to be tedious and time consuming and difficult. Um, I would rather do like a horsehair braid at the hem so the horsehair braid is this nylon trim, basically, that you add on the wrong side of the fabric that just adds stiffness. So you get, you know, the fabric really, you get a lot of volume with it and no extra weight um, and no extra fabric and stuff going on under it. Um, so horsehair braid is like a nylon kind of. Uh, braid trim and it comes in different widths you get your half inch all the way up to like a two inch um, it's typically used in bridal like wedding dresses and stuff um, so uh, yeah the the wider the braid the stiffer it's going to be and the more volume you're going to get um, so um, 
yeah, uh, and doing the circle skirt on the bottom of the pencil skirt um, is going to add volume as well, making it, um, it depends on your, your fabric and what you want to do. If you want to do like a half circle skirt or a full circle skirt, the full is going to be a lot of fabric. Mm -hmm. um, but that would probably be really fabulous to do a full circle skirt with some horsehair braid. I think that would look awesome. Yeah, I have I have an alternate suggestion. I because mine's more of a um I don't want to say a no sew option because obviously you're <laughs> sewing, <laughs> sewing the pencil skirt and you're sewing the circle skirt out of the bottom. But I actually so I did a, a wedding dress alteration a while ago and it was a trumpet cut, so not quite as you know drastic as a the mermaid cut. Um, and they had the same issue; they needed more fullness in it. And so rather than making my own gathered tool, I actually went on Amazon and bought one of those. And I'm forgetting the name of what they're called, but they you wear them. I wore them one underneath my wedding dress, and it already comes with all of the tool gathered in. And I know my mom's watching, and I hope she comments on here with that word because <laughs> I can't think of it. She'll remember. Um, and you can buy one in any different kinds of cuts. So you could either, you know, make your um, your costume and then just wear that underneath. Or like what I did is I actually bought one and then cut the gathered tool part off of it and then sewed it into the wedding dress so that it was still all one piece. But so that is an, an option too if you want sort of a quicker. And honestly, it was actually, I priced it out cheaper to buy one of those uh, than it was to buy all of the yardage of tool that I would have needed. So Good old yeah. the rescue, but yeah, um, I'll figure out what that's called and get back to you on that. Yeah. Is it like a like a petticoat? Um, a yes, but I feel like it's um, there's a different word for it. I know what I know because I I had one under my dress, my wedding dress too, and the word is escaping me as well. Me too. But yeah, that's a a really good idea, and a lot of times it can be cheaper to just buy something pre-made. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then having to buy all the tool because it's a lot yeah. of tool. It is, yeah. All right. As soon as that, that word pops into our heads, um, we will <laughs> revisit that. Um, but another question here from Brenda. She says she has lots of older thread. How do I freshen the old thread so it doesn't break? I know my grandma used to speak about freshening her thread, but I don't know how it was done. Um, yeah. So a note on old thread first. Um, old thread, you can use old thread vintage thread is fine to use as long as it was stored properly so sunlight uv light will weaken the threads weaken the fibers in the thread and give you a lot of breakage so um just make sure your your thread is stored away from sunlight and also away from humidity so in some place you know not in a corner of your basement where there's you know a lot of of wetness and humidity um, so that's uh, a good way to make your thread last uh, for your grandchildren. <laughs> Pass your thread stash down to your grandchildren. Um, keep it away from sunlight and humidity. Um, if your old thread uh, that you got from your grandmother uh, is giving you some issues, a lot of thread breakage and what have you, um, you can use um, thread to call. I only have fray check here, which is not what I'm looking for. What is it called? You have uh, It's just a thread conditioner. A thread conditioner. Oh, it's called Sewer's Aid. Sewer's oh, Aid. That's, that's right. what it is. It's a thread you conditioner. That. <laughs> so you just, you run a line of it, a little bead of it down, down your, your spool of thread and it just, it uh, conditions it, strengthens it. Um, and it comes in a bottle very similar to Fray Check. So before you put the thing on your thread, make sure, look at the bottle, make sure you're not putting your fray check on your thread. Um, but yes, yeah, Sewer's Aid is the name of it. And that can help condition your thread to prevent thread breakage. Yes. And to revisit, it's called a crinoline. Crinoline. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Right. That would have bothered me like all night. So I'm <laughs> figured out. <laughs> All right, next question here. This is from Jackie, my mom. She wants to know, does a dull needle affect the way a walking foot works? Um, I don't, I don't think it would affect the way the walking foot works. It would affect your tension and um, the way everything 
looks, but not necessarily the walking foot and the way the walking foot works itself. Um, another note about a dull needle though, um, there are certain fabrics that will dull your needle faster than others. Mm -hmm. um, fleece, felt, batting, especially the batting, the insulated batting with the flex of silver in it, um, that will dull your fabric a lot, dull your needle a lot quicker. Um, vinyl, leather and faux leather, things that are kind of hard on the tip of your needle will dull your needle quicker. Okay, I'm going to follow up with this question because I know what she's referring to. So like, <laughs> she's actually working on a quilt, so it's good that you say um, batting, but just stitching along with a walking foot and sometimes it just kind of gets stuck. Like it doesn't uh -huh. go through like it's supposed to and there isn't any visual like thread or something that the foot is physically catching on. So what could, what okay. is making that happen kind of thing? Yes. So yeah, that if you're, if your walking foot doesn't want to go and there's nothing it's getting caught on, that would absolutely be a sign of a dull needle because your needle is just having a hard time going through all of those layers because it's dulled. You know, it doesn't have the tip to pierce through all of those layers anymore and it would be slowing things down. I can see how that would happen. Gotcha. Perfect. All right. So mom, change your needle. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Our next question here, Charles wants to know, how can I take in the cuffs on a pair of snow pants with several layers? So snow pants that have several layers um i would say you know the the quick and easy solution is just to to pinch it in on the inside and it's gonna it would be thick probably with a snow pants um i've never done it before but i'm trying to imagine how that would work um yeah like like when i'm taking in an, an, a waistband for my mom mm -hmm. I, she's like just do whatever i don't care so i just like pinch in a little bit at each side on the inside um and then you can either it, for snow pants you wouldn't want to like cut it off probably cut off the excess you could either leave it or like almost flat felled seam it um so take your tuck and then fold it over and stitch that side to flatten it out. But with snow pants, I don't know how thick those layers are going to be. Some snow pants, you know, kids' snow pants are ridiculous and puffy. It might not work for that, but adult snow pants a lot of times are just um, made with like better material inside. So they're not as puffy to keep mm -hmm. you warm. It's just better material, you know? Um, so that would probably work for that because it wouldn't be as thick. So my answer is a definitive, I don't know. <laughs> so I'm, I'm thinking, so I'm envisioning um, just, it's been forever since I've worn snow pants, but if your if your reasoning is to, to just, you need to cinch in the leg a little bit because it's cumbersome when you're walking or skiing or whatever, could you just add elastic or something maybe in there to pull it in? Would that be another option? Since you obviously have, you know, multiple layers, you could really just kind of feed it in between the layers you have and then tack it in a few places and see if that will cinch in the leg. I'm all about making things easy. <laughs> yes, yeah, I can see um, threading some elastic either through the layers or even just on the inside. Mm -hmm. um, so adding elastic to something, you know, you, you cut the elastic um, a little bit smaller than what you're adding it to to draw in the circumference. Um, and then, uh, you know, quarter mark your elastic and quarter mark your cuff, match the marks and then stretch the elastic between the, the, the pins. Um, and that will, uh, then cinch the fabric in when the elastic relaxes. Mm -hmm. So it'll draw everything in. So yeah, I can see that working too. Perfect. I'm just trying to think like, like I mentioned, I've, I, it's been years since I've ever worn snow pants and I'm pretty sure when I did ever wear them, it was like once a season. So mm -hmm. not that I don't want to put a lot of effort into that necessarily, but if it's something that you're not going to be wearing, you know, all the time to work every day or something like that, like sometimes a quick and easy fix um, can be good. For so. sure. Yeah. All right. Next question here. This is from Gail and she says, any tips on sewing with sequined fabric? I'm planning on making my own bridesmaid dresses and using sequined fabric for the tops, but feeling a little intimidated. Wow. Well, congratulations. And 
Uh, good for you for taking that on. That's awesome. Um, so for sequin fabric, um, my main tip is going to be uh, removing the sequins from the seam allowances. Uh, you don't want to really be sewing over sequins. It'll damage your needle. It'll mess up your seams because if a needle hits a sequin and doesn't go through it, it'll skid off to one side and you'll get crooked seams, broken needles, um, not to mention bulk in the seam allowances. Um, so removing the sequins from your seam allowances um, and um, yeah, just making sure you're not sewing over your sequins. Mm -hmm. And so when you, it depends on what type of sequin fabric you have, because sometimes the sequins are uh, just like glued on separately. Sometimes they're all threaded together on one big string. So if you need to cut a string um, to remove the sequins from the seam allowance, you would then want to like put a little dot of glue or something to keep the rest of the sequins from falling off. But I know Ashley has a video on working with difficult or sequined or fabrics. You're stealing my line. That's like my <laughs> one line. We have a video on National Sewing Circle, and it's a, it's a whole class on working with difficult fabric, and sequin fabric is one of those sections. And so, yeah, I do talk about, um, depending on your manufacturer, it's either called like type A, type B, or type 1, type 2, and that's whether it's, you know, glued on or the sew-on variety. Regardless, I would still probably try and remove it. Um, if not from the seam line on both, then from what is gonna be turned under. I mean, I'm assuming if it's gonna be a bridesmaid's dress that it's gonna be, especially the top, probably lined on the inside to some extent. So you don't necessarily have to worry about the sequin like rubbing against your skin. Um, but you definitely still can, so like you mentioned, if it's so on, you just kind of clip the thread, um, take out the, the sequins that you want. And then I usually just, um, on, on any kind of sequin fabric and I've done, I don't even know how many um, prom dresses and every single one of them is beaded and sequined to no end. Um, and I always just go back like four or five, whatever it is, sequins or beads, and then just tie that with the thread. That way, um, that along with the fray check, you know it's not gonna come undone. But then even if it's just glued on, you can still take that sequin off by just actually using your iron, which I know sounds weird, but just you just are essentially warming up that glue and then it kind of melts it away and it just sticks to the tip of your iron. And then I usually have long fingernails and I just use my fingernail and just wipe it right off or just get a towel. So it's super easy to do. So don't think that you can't or that you have to like sit there and pick at this glue forever. Yeah, so, yeah that, that's definitely the main thing. Um, would you change up your needle at all? if you were working with a glue on sequin fabric that you know you're just gonna sew through? Um, maybe not. Maybe I would, I would stick with an all-purpose needle for, for that. Um, I know if you're sewing through something that has glue in it in some way, shape, or form, uh, people worry about getting like gunk on their needle. Um, but if you just keep like, if you find that it's getting gunked up and causing maybe tension issues or something, uh, you can get a cotton ball with rubbing alcohol and like clean it off of your needle every so often. Um, but if you're sewing your bridesmaid dresses and you're working with specialty fabrics like, uh, like satins or chiffon or something really fine and delicate, I recommend using a Microtex needle or even maybe just a, a thinner gauge of all-purpose needle, um, just to be really precise. And the Microtex needle just has a really fine, sharp tip that helps with precision and helps with eliminating snags that can be common on satin. Um, and also, you might want to think about using silk pins. Um, silk pins are just finer. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, they're finer than the regular pins, a thinner gauge, uh, sharper point, um, and they will make, they'll reduce the risk of you leaving holes in your fabric from your pins and also reduce the risk of snags. Yes, absolutely. I was going to say, I asked that needle question because I was actually making an Elsa costume back in the day and I was just going to sew through the um, glue on sequins. And so I thought, well, it's going to be 
heavier, I should definitely use the heavier weight needle, but the sequin is on a really lightweight mesh fabric. So I ended up with more problems than I, I created my own problem by using a way too heavy needle for the actual fabric. So yes, there was sequins which are heavier, but still based, I'd say based your needle choice off of the underlying fabric instead. Cause I, I had a whole mess. Yeah. Wrong needle. <laughs> All right, our next question here. When sewing, what makes the material pucker? Um, puckering can be uh, a couple different issues. It can be a tension issue. So if your tension is too tight, you'll get puckers. And even if your tension, your threads look balanced, if both tensions, your needle tension and your bobbin tension are too tight, you can still sometimes get puckers. So you may need to loosen your needle tension and your bobbin tension in that case. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I will get puckers on satin fabric by using uh, just the wrong combination of things. So if your thread is too heavy for your fabric, it can cause problems. So when you're using a really thin, lightweight fabric, you might want to use a lightweight thread or um, like a silk thread or a rayon thread is nice and um, thin and lightweight. Um, if your fabric um, is just really thin and delicate, it might just need a little bit of stability. So getting my tissue paper tip in here in the last couple minutes of the show, mm -hmm. um, adding just a layer of tissue paper under your fabric can sometimes give it just the stability that it needs for the thread to lay correctly on the fabric. And then you can just tear that tissue paper away afterwards. And um, that's that's how I, I solved my pucker problems. I was making a pair of satin pants, which I will never do again. <laughs> <laughs> but I was getting puckers and all kinds of issues and just adding some tissue paper under my layers helped give it the support and stability um, that it needed and it was great and sometimes the puckers will iron out mm -hmm. um, So try that first because that's the easiest thing. I Feel like only you could pull off satin pants like I would <laughs> never in my wild streams ever think of putting those on but good for you. So you. I have a, a follow-up question to this because I saw this again on Pinterest because I scroll through Pinterest all the time and I thought of you because it was somebody who was doing some stitching on um, terry cloth towels and they, rather than using tissue paper, they actually used um, like plastic bags, like grocery bags that you Ooh. would get. And I was wondering if you'd ever tried that. Um, and if you were thinking of doing that, do you know if that would affect your needle or anything? You know, I know you're tissue paper queen, but are there <laughs> other things you can use as well? Um, that's really interesting. I've never heard of that. I can imagine that working, especially for maybe even embroidery, because on em when you're embroidering on terry cloth or something that has a nap, you want to use that floater over the top to keep the, the threads from sinking into the pile. So they make them specifically for embroidery. It's, they call them toppers, or you can even use just the, the heat removable stabilizer as a topper. Um, but yeah, I can imagine just a plastic bag would do the same thing, just to give that that thread lift mm -hmm. so that it doesn't sink down into the pile. Um, and I imagine it would dull your needle a little quicker than normal because it's like it's plastic that the needle is going through. Even though it's really thin, your needle is still piercing that plastic a lot of times. I imagine it would dull your needle a little quicker than normal. See, I'm going to have to try this out and then I'll, I'll give you an update because I, I never have tissue paper when I need it, but I always have a million trash bags. So right. I'm pretty sure I'm going to try this out and let you know. Okay, please do. Okay. All right, our next question here. I got a sewing machine for Christmas. Any tips on how to choose my first project? Oh, well, congratulations. That's very exciting. Welcome to the sewing world. Um, so choosing your first project, you, you want to take it slow, you know, start with something really easy to build your confidence and build your skills. Um, def make sure you choose really cute fabric because that is, the fabric is like the most important thing because when it's finished, you know, that's the thing that pops out at you is the fabric or the print. So choose something super duper cute um, and go with something 
you know, nice and simple, something that doesn't require zippers and buttonholes and, you know, all kinds of crazy things build up to that. Um, so, you know, just, just straight lines, straight stitches. Um, scarves are a great project. Um, if you want to do, you know, you can do, do just your standard rectangular scarf, or you can do a circle scarf. That's a really cute and easy project. Um, all you need is two rectangles of fabric and um, you just, um, I won't be able to explain it correctly. Just Don't worry, we have, we have a video and sure. even an article on National Sewing Circle on a couple scarves on circle scarves or infinity scarves, whatever it is you want to call them. And um, we do have, like I said, a video and an article. So if you want like an actual pattern for that too, that's also included in the article. Um, but that was going to be my thing is that uh, my tip for choosing your first project would be to make it something that you can either wear or use when you're done because I feel like you get more satisfaction being able to use it or show it off and be like, look, I made this, you know, so that way it's not just something that you made and it's going to sit in a closet somewhere. So being able to appreciate what you made is going to make you want to make more things. Yes, absolutely. Pillowcases are a great, mm -hmm. easy one. Yep. Curtains even. Cur that's a little bit, maybe it's a little bigger, bit. But yeah. Yeah, bigger, but it's still just rectangles and straight mm -hmm. stitches. So that's fun too, is yeah. doing curtains because it's, you know, right there on your wall and everybody can see it. We have a video on National Sewing Circle for both for both curtains and also balances. So we have one for both if you want to make one of each. Um, all right, next question here. Brenda says she's making a vest for her oldest son with some fancy brocade. What type of lining do you recommend? Um, so for lining, um, definitely something lightweight and thin. Um, rayons, nylons, blends are good for linings because um, – they're, they're slippery, uh, so it makes it easier to get on and off, which is more important in jackets than in vests, but still. Um, yeah, just something lightweight. Um, actually, if you're just doing a vest, you could probably just use, you know, like a lightweight cotton even, and then you don't have to worry about the slipperiness of the lining. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, as long as it is something that... Um, kind of matches um, the color of the uh, the vest, which is not even necessarily, you don't really need to need to match, but um, if, you, if the lining and vest is going to, like if you're turning the lining under right at the edge, that's the only reason I would say to get a matching lining because it might, you know, you might be able to see it on the edge. <laughs> And you can try to, you know, turn that under a little bit more than having it match, uh, the, the seam match right on the edge, but, right. but just for safety. So I've only, I've had a little bit of experience sewing with brocade fabric, but it's been years. I used to be really into like oriental print fabrics and all of that. Um, but the one thing I remember about brocade is how, how staticky it is and how much it ravels. So do you have any sort of general tips on how to tackle those two main issues of brocade fabric? Um, yeah, so um, for raveling, if you have something that ravels a whole bunch, um, just finishing the edges as soon as you cut it out, um, like overcast the edges. But uh, if you're surging the edges, make sure you don't cut any off of your seam allowance because that's going to mess with the whole rest of your project. Um, but you can even just zigzag stitch to overcast over the edge to keep those threads from wrap, uh, fraying and unraveling all over the place. Um, and as far as it being staticky, that would probably be a good reason to use a cotton fabric as a lining rather than rayon or nylon because that can be staticky themselves. And cotton, I feel like, absorbs or doesn't generate as much static electricity as other fabrics. Right. Absolutely. All right. And we have a follow up to that. Also, any information on welt pockets would be greatly appreciated. Ah, welt pockets. Um, so welt pockets. I did a video, didn't I? <laughs> I no. 
Yes, I did. And Welt Pockets, I would love to be able to describe it for you right now, but it's hard without samples and we're running out of time. But um, yes, I did a video on National Sewing Circle, uh, a couple different ways to do um, Welt Pockets and I think bound buttonholes too, which is basically the same technique. Mm -hmm. Check that out. Yes. We have a couple, I think, for everything, yes. Yeah. As you mentioned, we are kind of running out of time, but we have a couple more here. So um, Terry wants to know, to take in woven slacks, would you take in both the inseam and the side seam? Um, depending on how much you need to take it in, yes. Um, just like in pattern making, if you need to take size off of something you want to take it off of different areas so that you don't end up looking lopsided um because if you just took everything off of the outer seam that would affect the fit of the rest of the pants um so yeah breaking it up and taking some off of the side and some off of the inseam would be a good idea i would say so sort of follow up on that just i was just think it would, would um, necessarily your body type have any play on where you decide to take in the pant? Like if you're fuller in the hips, you know, versus somewhere else. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, all body types are different. You know, all bodies are different. And, um, you know, you might need more taken out in some places rather than others. So it's not going to be a uniform, not necessarily a uniform, you know, one inch all the way down here and one inch on the inseam. Um, I'd say try on the pants yeah, inside out and pin out what you need, where you need it. Um, and that'll give you a little map of where, how much to take out where. Yes, we, we don't necessarily have a video on someone wearing their pants inside out on National Sewing Circle, but we do have one where Aurora wears her shirt inside out and shows us sort of the same idea of how to just like pinch in when you're taking in a shirt. So you can absolutely do the exact same thing with whatever article of clothing it is that you want to take, take in. So we're about at the end of the hour, so I just have to do a couple little pitch things for our um, sister site, actually. So National Quilter Circle, we're getting ready to start our next mystery challenge. So even if you've never done any kind of quilting, sometimes people who do sewing like to branch out into the quilting world as well. Um, so we definitely encourage you to sign up for that. And there is a banner, uh, should be somewhere on the page where you're watching the video and you can click and join that. That starts soon. So I definitely hope everyone does that because I want to see you there. And since we have one minute left, Cindy wants to know, do you have to use a certain foot with the elastic thread? No, you can just use your regular normal sewing foot and use your do your elastic thread and shearing. No special things needed. Perfect. Awesome. I want to thank you so much for being back here to do our uh, live event and answer all of our questions. We missed you. We're glad you're back. I have missed everyone too. I'm so happy to be back. Perfect. And we'll see you again next month. And I hope everyone joins us again with some more sewing questions that Nikki can answer.